This video marks the beginning of a series of videos focusing on the psychology of diversity. In this video specifically, we'll explore several ways that we can think about diversity. That is, we'll investigate several different perspectives on, or lenses through which we can look at, diversity. But before we get to all that, let's start at the very beginning by defining what we mean by diversity in the first place. Broadly speaking, diversity is the presence of difference. But in psychology and in this series of videos, diversity is the presence of social differences among people. Okay, now let's discuss these few different ways that are not all inclusive that we can approach and conceptualize diversity, starting with diversity as a demographic concern. So here we're focused on sort of the range or the proportion of social differences, and I'll get to that term in a minute, that are represented in a certain situation or among a group of people or an organization, things like that. So social differences, what do I mean by that? Well, you've probably heard the term individual differences before, which is sort of a dimensional approach to understanding differences between different people. For example, how religious Tom is on a scale of 1 to 10 versus how religious Sally is on a scale of 1 to 10. These would be individual differences. Social differences, in contrast, what we're referring to here, refer more to sort of categories of people. So it's a categorical difference between social groups, like being Christian versus being Jewish. So social differences require group identification, like I identify as a Christian or I identify as a person who's Jewish versus being uh, sort of a dimensional, I'm a 7 out of 10 in religiosity in this dimension. So that's the difference here. And when we're talking about diversity as a demographic concern, we're specifically focused on social differences. Now, focusing on representation or the numbers isn't inherently a bad thing. We know that compositional diversity, that is the statistical representation of different groups of people within a given environment, like a classroom or an office or a workspace, this matters and it does make a difference, but that shouldn't be our only concern. Social categories are useful for describing people and they are adaptive in that they allow us to sort of guess information about people. But as we'll see in this series of videos, this has a very dark side as well. So the key for us as psychologists is that we don't just care about social statistics. Rather, we want to know how these social identities, these social differences, affect a person's thoughts, emotions, and behavior. Next, we have a diversity as a political concern, which involves identifying particular social groups that have faced disadvantages or discrimination in the past, historically speaking or presently, and ensuring that they are included, or at the very least, not excluded. And this is great, but uh, again, it has some problems. So legal definitions typically include uh, women and some minority groups, but not others, which is problematic. And also, they tend to focus, these legal definitions, tend to focus on visible social identities, whereas many social identities may not always be apparent, as we'll talk about in future videos. What about diversity as an ideological concern? Well, there's at least three different ideological perspectives of diversity that we can discuss. The melting pot, multiculturalism, and colorblindness, and I'll discuss each in turn. The melting pot starts with this uh, idea that a diverse society is one in which everyone is welcome, which sounds great so far, right? But here's the caveat. It sort of, in practice, tends to involve an acceptance of other people's differences, of social differences, with a stipulation that those people are still devoted to the majority groups, typically white people, in our society at least, uh, values and goals. And we refer to this as assimilationism, assimilating, right? There's a great quote from Edgar F. Beckham, who was a chairman of the Connecticut State Board of Education, who led national efforts to promote diversity in higher education. And he said, how unfortunate, especially in a democracy, that we fail to note how insistently diversity also points to unity. And I think this sums up the melting pot uh, very well. Next, we have multiculturalism, which is sort of my favorite approach. And multiculturalism promotes the recognition, the appreciation, the celebration, and or the preservation uh, of social difference. So I like to think of it as sort of like a, a unity quilt, right? So here we have all of these different squares sewn on this quilt, and each one represents a different culture or nationality or whatever. And I like to think of it in this way because all of these are still connected, and together they create this whole, which you can think of as like, 
the United States of America, if you want to think of it that way. And each quilt is representing a certain subset of America, right? So they all are connected to form this whole, but each is unique and it retains its own identity. And I just love that approach. In stark contrast, we have the colorblind approach. If you've ever heard someone say, I don't see color or I don't see race, this is what we call colorblindness. So according to this ideology, people should be considered strictly as individuals and we should ignore or de-emphasize uh, any social group membership. Specifically, this is usually thought of in regards to race or ethnicity, but we can apply the same ideology beyond that. Now, typically this is held, this, this belief, this orientation is held by the majority group toward, in particular, again, racial minority groups. And it sounds okay on the surface, perhaps, but under the hood, what we have going on is, you know, this idea of diversity is great, but race shouldn't inform our decisions and everyone should sort of still strive to behave like the mainstream. So at the end of the day, we're minimizing other people's identities, like their race or ethnicity, that might be very important to them. Next, we have diversity as a social justice concern. So along with social distant, difference, excuse me, comes uh, inequality, inequity, disadvantage, problems in society. And these are problems that people who care about social justice want to fix. And social justice, if you're doing it right, means striving for social equality and equity. And I wanna really, at the beginning of these uh, videos here, take a minute to differentiate between the two because there aren't uh, they aren't the same thing. And here's how I like to visualize the difference between equality and equity. So equality on the, le on the left, so you have three different people who are trying to watch like a baseball game, right? Now obviously there's big differences in height. On the very left you have, I think, a man who's, who's very tall, and then you, know, you have a, a child and then a very small child. Now we've given each of these people a box, so it's equal. We've, we're offering them the same thing to begin with. However, the end result is definitely not equitable, right? So we're equal in what we're giving people, but at the end of the day, that small child can't see at all. And the tall guy doesn't need a box to begin with. So equality in this case actually isn't the best solution because the end result isn't equitable. Now, when we have this equitable solution on the right, everyone can watch the game. So the result is equitable. The man doesn't need, the adult male, I should say, doesn't need uh, the box, so we don't give him one. The young child needs two boxes to be able to see, so we give the young child two. This is an equitable outcome. So social uh, justice involves striving for both equality when it's appropriate and also equity when it's appropriate and fair and makes the most sense too. So those are all sorts of different approaches beyond psychology, and psychologists care about many of those, right? We care about social justice. Many psychologists care about the politics and the policies that uh, sort of influence people, especially in regards to diversity. But psychology of diversity is something a little bit broader. Psychology of diversity involves how um, sort of understanding, trying to understand how people's thoughts, feelings, and behavior are intertwined with people's social environments and their social identities, right, the diversity. So psychologists, again, we care about all of these different things, but we have uh, a little bit more of a focus on the thoughts, feelings, and behavior that sort of stem from all of these other issues. And two principles follow from this sort of a approach. First of all, diversity is socially constructed. And second of all, diversity is a social influence. Let me tell you what I mean by both of those, starting with the first. Diversity is socially constructed. So first, the individual is a social perceiver. This is one fundamental truth we think of in psychology. And this means that you know we perceive the environment and we make judgments about our environment, and in particular, our social environment. Sometimes we call these thin slice ju uh, judgments, excuse me. There's been some amazing studies out there in psychology, for example, where you can give people a short video clip, like three seconds long, without any audio, and ask people questions about it. So for example, there was a study done where um, you gave people a clip of a, a man speaking and no audio, right, three seconds long, and you were supposed to judge the sexual orientation of that of that man. And participants were amazing at guessing the sexual orientation with such thin slice information. Similarly, uh, uh, in a different study, they were given, uh, participants in the study were given a short video clip of a professor speaking in a class. Again, no audio, no subtitles, short video clip, uh, just a few seconds long, and they were asked to judge 
uh, how good of a teacher this person is, kind of guess their teaching evaluations. And they were amazingly accurate in guessing the teaching evaluations just on that thin slice information. So we are social perceivers and we perceive the environment, make judgments about them. We're also social actors, meaning when we interact with someone, we bring our own beliefs and expectations to bear. So this changes how we act toward them, these beliefs and expectations, which in turn changes how they react toward us, which if we're thinking about like racial differences, this can cause conflict, this can exacerbate differences, uh, whatever the case is. But we act on our environments in addition to just perceiving it. So we're sort of socially constructing our own social environments. But diversity is also a social influence, meaning diversity influences your identity and other people's identities as well. Our identities, as I just kind of described, are influenced by what others believe about us, our race, our gender, our whatever, and by how they perceive us. So not only do we influence diversity, but diversity also influences us. And as a very simple example, we can take Bill here. Let's say that Bill sees himself as smart, active, outgoing, stylish, and so on. These are aspects of Bill's identity. But Bill's in a wheelchair, and so maybe other people focus on this wheelchair aspect of, of who he is, and uh, they focus on his disability. Now imagine what it would be like to be Bill, right? He can maybe be frustrated, maybe this lowers his self-esteem. And so what we're gonna do in this series of videos is investigate the psychological experience of being different from others. We will focus on other aspects of these uh, perspectives that I've described today, like social justice and so on, but our focus will always be psychology of diversity. So the experience psychologically of being socially different from others.